This is Guardian Radio, your station for up-to-the-minute news, intelligent, interactive, and engaging conversation. 96.9 FM. This is a special episode of The Essentials with Hubert Edwards. Tonight, Hubert is hosting the Organization for Responsible Governance's Economic Roundtable with the theme, The Road Beyond 50, a discussion on the vision for the next 50 years of development of the Bahamian economy. Panelists include Minister of Economic Affairs, Senator the Honorable Michael Halkidis, Member of Parliament and Shadow Minister of Finance, Kwesi Thompson, and Governor of the Central Bank, John Roll. National e-commerce digital marketplace. These are the things that I can see. In education, industry and Bahamian tertiary institutes are all in sync and provide a seamless transition uh, from institute to workforce. Youth empowerment and unemployment are tackled together. You know, we take advantage of the revenue generating opportunities from, from the environment without overtaxing Bahamians. The Bahamas has a modern renewable energy infrastructure, which keeps electricity cost, as I see, that could be lower than in Florida. Foreign investment and Bahamian investment is not only welcome, but sought out with digital applications approved in days. And I agree with uh, the minister, small businesses are treasured and given all of the necessary resources to flourish. In agriculture, I see where we can uh, produce 50% of the food that we consume. Um, and we can actually export niche products like honey. Our state-owned enterprises, uh, which have been a challenge for, uh, for all of us, have either been privatized or uh, make enough revenue uh, to cover the expenses and require no subsidies. That would be great. Um, in tourism, the Bahamas uh, now has a quarter of the home porting business that Miami enjoys, which means flights and hotels are fully booked year round. And as again, uh, in agreement with the, with the minister, our family islands become a hub for vacation rentals. The great thing is this vision, because it is a vision as to where we can go, is wholly attainable and within our reach. Over the past 50 years, successful, successive administra administrations have in different ways laid the building blocks for making this vision a reality. And so the question is, can we make this vision a reality? Of course we can. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Mr. Thompson. I want to start at the most important, uh, at a most important place, not the most important place. I want everyone within our listening here to, to be conscious that Mr. Thompson agreed with the Senator twice in five minutes. And so this obviously sets the tone for a very, very good discussion. That doesn't usually happen, but certainly you have outlined a vision a vision of how we can move the country from where it is through digital transformation, youth empowerment, looking at home porting, 50% uh, ability to feed ourselves by 50%, that is growth in agriculture, and certainly uh, looking at Grand Bahama with 250,000 persons, that would touch on immigration policies. We will certainly come back to that. Now we go to the gentleman who has his hands on the number. He has his hands on the international trend. And he knows inside out what are some of the things which are necessary to facilitate growth and the development of the country, where the reforms are needed, especially in the financial sector. Governor Roll, it's now over to you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Hubert. And it's a pleasure to be on this panel this evening with uh, Minister Halkitas and uh, Minister Thompson. I think you still uh, retain that, that honor. And I want to thank uh, the Organization for Responsible Governance for inviting me on the panel. I was hesitant at first, but um, um, I decided nonetheless because I think it's important to have these kinds of conversations. What I think is very important to always acknowledge is that I think as a country, we should be our uh, harshest critics, particularly in terms of how we shape the ambition of a country for the future. But we should also acknowledge that uh, the Bahamas has made you know, tremendous progress uh, in the last 50 years, very high per capita income, 
are within the top three in the Americas. Stable inflation, which is partly a reflection of being able to maintain a, a stable currency fixed to the United States dollar and the exchange control policies which surround that, but all of the, um, the constructive criticisms that go uh, with that framework. Tourism is still very dominant in the economy and its growth and development. Uh, we have a financial services sector that has been with us throughout, but it is now under increased scrutiny, particularly in the last two decades in terms of the influence of the uh, the internationals in terms of the, the pressures that, that have come to bear. And um, so we, we we know that the political pressures and forces, we have we have to address those. We also have in the, the more recent, you know, two decades, you know, a gradually uh, worsening uh, situation in terms of the, the health of the government's balance sheet. And um, we are under greater scrutiny in terms of our domestic financial services sector, how it is uh, affecting financial inclusion, access, as well as the ease of uh, doing business generally. So those are some of the areas where we know that uh, while we've made progress, uh, you can begin to stick some pin in terms of the way forward. I think what is most important for this country going forward, we have a litany of ideas as to what uh, should be done. And I think we all know some of the, uh, the talking points. We have to focus much more on execution, making the very difficult decisions, that are needed to reform uh, the country. And we have to make some of those decisions on our own voluntarily without being pushed. The future Bahamas has to be one where we're growing faster on average than between you know, one and a half to 2%. Um, that is how we're gonna get the average unemployment rate below where it presently is. The last good spell for us before we had the 2008 recession, unemployment sort of drifted closer to, I think, around 7%. That's still very high. And we know we have to get it much lower. And I think it means that we have to make the lasting changes so that the economy can grow faster. We have to invest in upskilling the population. The model of the Bahamas during the 80s and the 90s was we provide a scholarship to Bahamians to get undergraduate degrees. Now that we have a university, put more money into higher education, graduate level and above, so that we can train even more and more of our undergraduates at home. So I think that is very important. We have to focus on the outcomes that make the Bahamas more resilient in terms of the climate change and related issues, more diversified in ways that Minister Alkidas and uh, Mr. Thompson has already mentioned and more competitive in the international sense. And I think in terms of competitiveness, we cannot shy away from the difficult uh, issues around immigration policies, because I think some of the transitional momentum we need to be uh, competitive and to develop certain sectors means that we have to be more um, uh, receptive to, you know, skilled labor coming in for a while in some of our sectors so that we can work alongside them and we can develop the expertise. And, and, and I think policies in those regards also have a bearing on how we were able to track attract investments from, from abroad into various sectors. The very difficult questions around taxation, we have to embrace those. One of the things that makes the government's effort so much easier is having a tax system where you can give incentives to businesses in a very targeted way if you need to to stimulate investments in particular sectors and activities. And if you have the system designed correctly, and I'm speaking frankly about how we approach income taxation, it also makes it easier for a government to provide the very direct and targeted assistance to families, as well as to be able to exempt at certain income thresholds those who we agree should be relieved more of, of, of tax burden. So I think we have, we're have we going to have to, in the future Bahamas, deal with taxation more head on and all of the difficult dimensions that are there. Insurance is an issue when we speak to resilience, meaning that as we move ahead, 
we are not going to get away with just saying, well, it is very expensive to insure homes, et cetera, because we live in the hurricane belt. Uh, we, we cannot shy away from the fact that the cost of insurance is a part of the cost of home ownership affordability. And we have to think about in the future, how do we right size the homes that we construct and occupy so that they can be affordable and, and be resilient in the hurricane belt and um, that, that we were not entirely at the mercy of public assistance whenever uh, there is a setback. But resilience also means that we have to get the government in a healthy position so that it can invest more in hardening our infrastructure so that we can address the increasing um, violent storms as well as the threats that are ahead of us in terms of the of sea level rise. So, so we have to be able to fund the investments in being a more resilient uh, country. In terms of the financial sector, I'm just about ending. Efficiency, I think, looks a lot like some of the points that uh, Mr. Thompson would have mentioned. Um, and we have to make certain that that efficiency also means that the services are accessible to all. And so we talk about financial inclusion in, in, in very um, important ways. We have to be able as domestic actors to take more control of the, the funds that are in our financial system and to be able to channel it into investments that look different from the, the lending model of the banks. It's not to criticize the bank model, but for us to recognize that that the kind of changes that one may wish to see in some of those areas means that we have to, to construct the vehicles, whether they're venture capital or investment banking models or the like, that get more of the savings which already exist into the, the business sectors. We have to be able to do that through the private sector and recognize that the, the public sector's role in terms of even providing venture capital is is unlikely going to be able to mobilize the level of resources that exist in the in, in the financial space and already in the hands of the private sector. And I also think that we have to envision visage that the financial sector in the future, given the expertise that Bahamians have, particularly when you look at the international side, we have to own more of the foreign facing businesses that are providing financial services. And we have to be prepared, particularly within our hemisphere, to also envisage that we go into lots of these other domestic markets with our Bahamian capital providing financial services in those areas. So I think that is very, very important. And I know that there is an aspiration uh, by many, perhaps even in this webinar, that they don't experience a future where um, exchange control looks and feels the way it does, even though today it is still largely about, um, you know, portfolio investment. Um, personally, I would like to see that too. And I understand that that means, again, that you got to reform the country in the meaningful ways. You got to put the government finances in a very strong and healthy uh, position. And you got to work on all of the, the dimensions around making uh, the economy more resilient and, and, and having the linkages with tourism. And, and just to conclude on tourism, I believe that in addition to the linkages, we, not, we now need to start realizing that the Bahamas and Bahamian entrepreneurs and investors need to have direct ownership participation in the cruise sector too. So when we look into the future, let's also begin to think about how we can have an ownership interest and present in the cruise industry. And that way I think it, 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 it would help to keep even more of the industry in terms of its earnings and revenues inside the Bahamas. And I think, I think that is a very important way to focus. So here, but I'll stop there, and I hope we've provided a base for anything that could come up during the uh, discussions. Certainly, thank you so much, Governor. You have provided uh, a mouthful, and I think this is a, is a great place to start this conversation. We have Senator Halkitis, who is 
um, currently part of the administration. We have Mr. Thompson, who is a part of the opposition and therefore a part of the government. So that's the, the kind of yin and yang of governance. And then we have the, the governor who forms part and part of the policy intelligentsia, but due, due to his role and responsibility has to be uh, a, a little bit more independent. But this evening, your presentation, Governor Rule, I would sum it up in one word, reform. And I believe fundamentally, I agree with you, if we are going to see a vibrant Bahamas beyond 50, then the reforms which we have been discussing, the things that we know need to be done, must start now. So I, we are now into our, our discussion session, and I just want to, to throw out the first question, and I'm going to start with reform. Senator Alkitis, how do we get to the place where the urgent reforms which are needed we start to move them forward. I know that there's been a lot of talk, there's been a lot of discussion. We have had this, uh, um, discussions here and there, but oftentimes they're in the abstract. How do we get to a place where we come together with a consensus, opposition and administration, all the peoples of the Bahamas, and decide that this is the path forward for the country? You are muted, you're muted. I think, I think we, as a, as a first step, as you said, we need to have uh, some consensus because I think we all recognize that uh, reform is needed, um, beginning in the way that government does business and delivers services uh, to to the people. Um, Mr. Thompson spoke about uh, digitization, and we have a a um, fairly robust digitization program that we're seeking to roll out across all uh, government services. It needs to be um, accelerated, and um, you know we're we're committed uh, to doing that. But I think we we uh, a part of the base for those discussions will be let's dust off that um, national development plan. All right, which I think uh, is the result of uh, well, which I know is the result of um, a lot of consultation, a lot of um, um, bipartisan uh, agreement, I think. And, um, you know, that that is the, the, you know, the basis from which we begin because, you know, as you rightly say, there's a lot of reform that needs to be done in the way our government would deliver services in our taxation model. You know, we have, um, and as the governor said, as part of the assault on our financial services industry, we have this um, global minimum tax initiative, uh, which has um, spurred us, um, you know, in, in some form in a former administration and then um, the previous administration to this one to um, um, commission a study on our taxation model and options um, that we should explore. Um, we will have a, a, a um, green paper come out to, to discussing what the options are, but we know that um, any you know one of the most contentious things that any government can talk about is taxation, mm -hmm. and particularly when you're talking about reform and and perhaps introducing new um, new methods that were not previously existing in the country. And a, a, a major, I mean, fundamental to that sort of reform is to be able to bring all of the stakeholders around the table, the government, the opposition, the um, stakeholders in terms of private sector, and um, you know, members of representation from the public, and be able to you know, arrive at a consensus that, okay, best practice is such, and this is what we need to do if we need to, to um, you know, um, bring in more fairness, um, more equity, more efficiency, uh, but we need to have that um, that discussion. So it begins with a, a meeting of the mind, so to speak, a sharing of information, and um, you know that is where sometimes it gets a bit it, it gets a bit tricky because in all of those things that I, I all those groupings there are competing interests, and how do you how do you get to to the to the um, to a conclusion that you say okay we can galvanize around and move forward. So Definitely. the the um, 
the, the beginning is that, um, you know, I think we dust off the National Development Plan. It's an excellent roadmap. Uh, we pick out a few uh, a few things. You know, we talk with um, Mr. Tom, who spoke about digitization as a means of being more efficient in everything. Um, okay. You know, Governor spoke about the taxation. Those are reforms that we need to, to push for. It needs to be a national conversation. Um, certainly. Uh, yeah. Along the same line, Mr. Thompson, reform. You spoke of a Grand Bahama, and this has become a, a, a common theme where it is said that the fate of the Bahamas as a whole sits fundamentally on the fate of Grand Bahama. But over the last 15, 20 years, Grand Bahama has meandered on the horizon of possibilities, but has not yet delivered anything. 250,000 persons within the within Grand Bahama driving it. You're talking about the Silicon Valley of, uh, of the Caribbean, which I think Grand Bahama would play a significant role in that. As a, as a member of the opposition, certainly a member of Her Majesty's formal government, what are some of the reforms that you would be willing to push in the era of uh, immigration, bringing in additional um, talent, bringing in the type of investments at the small and medium-sized level? What are some of the things that you would be willing to push and advocate for from a reform perspective to make this happen? So again, th I thank you. I think it's a, it's a very important question, um, uh, particularly when you look at reform. And, and uh, with Grand Bahama, the immigration question, um, I think is, is, is a key part of it. But just before you, you um, I get there, uh, I did want to comment just on, on uh, those two points, I think, that um, uh, Senator Alkidis uh, mentioned. Uh, one would have been... Uh, the difficult question, and he is absolutely right, uh, the difficult question of reform uh, as it relates to taxation. Um, but I think where we begin uh, with that, as uh, and, and I again agree with, with that concept, where we, where we begin is consultation, consultation, consultation. Um, I think uh, we have to uh, speak to all of the stakeholders um, and provide them with all of the options uh, and listen to them, hear from them, uh, and uh, all together, uh, based on all of the all of the information, then we make uh, the best uh, the best decision. I think the global tax initiative is an avenue upon which we can start that discussion um, because the global uh, tax initiatives, puts you in that position where uh, you have to now look at uh, uh, the uh, corporate tax. Uh, you have to now look at how that affects the Bahamas economy, how that affects uh, companies in the Bahamas. And it gives you an avenue upon which you can now start the discussion uh, in terms of uh, how you modify business license, um, how you look at uh, corporate tax, um, and so on. So I think the, uh, we had once we had agreed to the global tax initiative when we were uh, we were in government we had committed to uh, again the same process of uh, putting forward a, a white paper in terms of starting that uh, that discussion with uh, with stakeholders so I think that's where we start off with with respect to uh, that whole question of, of tax but it also requires political will um, uh, to do so. And and, um, and and that I think um, is one of the challenging things. With respect to the digitization reform, there's some things that you just have to do. <laughs> you and you you almost just have to uh, force to be done um, because the system does not want to change, and the system has within itself uh, their own reason for not wanting to change. They're not comfortable with change, and then there's some other reasons why they, they don't they don't want to change. Um, but there are just some reforms I would suggest, particularly when it comes to digitization, that uh, we just have to uh, proceed with um, and 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 move forward with. And we educate uh, persons. We do our best to be inclusive with persons. We do our best also to provide op different options for people. But I think we have to just make the decision to do so. 
uh, and take advantage of crisis. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, COVID taught us uh, were, and, it, and it pushed us to do certain things, to put in place certain things. Uh, COVID really pushed us to, to expedite uh, the My Gateway platform. Um, it pushed us to do certain uh, initiatives, be, not because they were nice things to do, but just because they were necessary things to do in uh, in the light of COVID. So uh, we must take advantage of those things. Now, getting to Grand Bahama, uh, one of the things that I really believed in was the Tech Hub initiative for, for Grand Bahama, which would require uh, Bahamians being trained to uh, perform these technology jobs. But in addition to Bahamians being trained, uh, we also had to import the top tech talent. Um, and so one of the initiatives that we had we had did was we had started the BH1B visa, um, uh, where uh, we had said that if you could qualify for an H1B visa in the US, uh, then we, we would look at you uh, for uh, being able to come into uh, uh, the Bahamas on a technology uh, basis. Uh, and that is, again, not competing with Bahamians because one of the things that we want to do is preserve Bahamian employment and pre preserve Bahamian ownership. No but we also have to uh, do this in conjunction with bringing in arbitration is also one of those areas that Grand Bahama would be suited for, and you would, again, have to bring in uh, different talent uh, in order to do so. And I think Grand Bahama has the capacity um, to take on uh, those additional persons, but we must put in place the protections for uh, Bahamians as well. Very well put. And I, I, I think, though, and oftentimes we maybe become uncomfortable having this discussion, is that some of the reforms which are needed are going to be in the first instance very disruptive. But I would submit to everyone here on the panel that that level of disruption is going to be necessary. There's no way of avoiding it. And while we understand and appreciate the political um, tension, we appreciate the tensions of resources, limited resources, and so on and so forth, it becomes necessary because there is a price to be paid if we wait too long to start to initiate these um, reforms. I want to go to you, Governor Rule, And you mentioned a number of times that the government need to be in a position, I'm paraphrasing here, the government needs to be in a position to be able to afford to do the things which are necessary, i.e., we need to have a stronger balance sheet. Talk to us about how this factors into the current day policies and where would we need to make the changes in order to facilitate that future Bahamas that you envision? Well, I think the the most direct way of saying it is that we 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 we, we all aspire to see the government's uh, debt uh, level shrink, not just as a precise relative to the economy, but but in absolute terms. And so right. we know that that means that um, we. We're asking the government to make uh, difficult choices around how it's spending the resources that it's receiving, as well as focusing on on the adequacy of the resources that the government receives. It's it is not true that the um, the taxes in the Bahamas are as high as some people say they are. The government of the Bahamas is small relative to the size of the economy and compared to many other countries. It's not saying that we should aspire to be the size of the other economies, but it gets to the point that we have to recognize that a lot more of the essential services that the government needs to provide and may not be able to provide now comes down to uh, not having the the resources, the financial resources. Yes, uh, we could probably all agree that you could find some efficiencies here or there in the way the government is operating. But I would argue that um, there is no amount of efficiency that we might have in mind that will generate the savings for the Bahamas to provide the level of public services that um, we 
we deserve to have in this country for the, the level of income and wealth that this country has. So some of it will still come down to how we better resource the government and how we better provide skills, human resources skills, uh, to help run the government. So, so from that point of view, but having the government in a healthy position is important. As an example, whenever there is a conversation, whether it's real or imagined in the Bahamas about the debt and the deficit, read the comments online. Somewhere in the comments, you start to see a lot of comments that say, well, something's going to happen to your dollar. So Bahamas understand that somehow the health of the government has a bearing on this currency that they hold so precious of being tied to the, to the U.S. dollars. And there's a lot of education around getting them to clear up some of the misconception. But it means that when we talk about opening up more and allowing people to move monies back and forth more freely because it's good for investments and it's less distortionary and it's promoting savings, you want people to do that without being worried about whether, you know, the exchange rate is going to be under pressure or or you're going to have, you, know, you, you have to speculate as to whether you should keep your money here or there. You want them to focus on the fundamentals as to how they make, make money or, or make returns. And part of the way you do that is to make certain that they are not distracted by the health of the government's uh, finances. And therefore, getting the government to a healthy position is also a way of removing the government a lot from the equation in terms of when investors are looking at positive reasons for, for moving monies in various directions so that you can get people to operate in a calmer state of mind when they focus on savings and investment. Also, it speaks to the flexibility that a government has in times of crisis when it absolutely needs to be able to step forward. So just to give an example, it doesn't matter how we view the, the buildup in the debt that happened because of COVID. What we must realize is that if we were not in the position to do that because we already had a lot of debt, then the Bahamas would have fared much worse during the pandemic. And so that gets to the point that you want to have a nice cushion so that when it really, really uh, is necessary, you can step in as a government and provide the sort of stabilization and support that is necessary. And so, so I think we also need to keep that in mind too when we, when we start to talk about getting the government in a healthier situation. And it is no different from any family or household who may be either uh, on the edge or comfortable about how they would deal with uh, an emergency situation. I think that is important. And in a, in, in a way, you are actually speaking to resiliency. We talk often mm -hmm. about resiliency, and in many instances, we immediately segue into the climate issue. But certainly the ability for the, the ability of the government to respond in, 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 in moments of crisis, the ability to afford the investment, the ability to afford the spend on social security measures and so on and so forth is so, so critical. I want to move maybe along the same line, but a little bit different, uh, Senator Alkita. Mm -hmm. The recent financial strategy report, mm -hmm. which came out earlier this year, made some very bold pronouncements. Mm -hmm. And one of those pronouncements, and this is my paraphrasing, is that over the next five to six years, we are going to move our GDP from where it's currently at to about 16 billion dollars and we're going mm -hmm. to move top line revenue to four billion dollars which based on my layman calculation give me a somewhere average about 4.5 to 5 percent cadence each year mm -hmm. having regard to what we heard from the governor and is admonishing that we need to move our growth reality better it's certainly the right direction. It's certainly in the right direction from an ambition perspective. But on the ground, my question to you, as a part of the administration, what are the things already done mm -hmm. to facilitate this growth over the next two to three years and certainly then into the fourth and the fifth year? Where there are, are two, the reforms that support this movement? There, there are two, there are two um, things uh, working. Number one, the... Um, 
attraction of, of foreign direct investment. Um, we have um, you know, made some reform as to the way uh, we deal with, um, with, with um, studying, with analyzing and approving foreign direct investment. Um, simple, something as simple as more regular meetings so that they can be dealt with. You know, we're, we're having meetings on just about a weekly basis to deal with investments and really streamlining the process of approval so that we can get to the point where you, you can get to shovel in the ground as soon as possible. The second um, thing that's 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 working and you'll see uh, some uh, more activity, um, you know, even before we get to the budget is we have to, so we have these investment projects, um, you know, um, in, in the various islands, in Abaco, in Eleuthera, Long Island. Um, the second um, element of this is um, you have to have an enhanced investment in your infrastructure, because particularly your family island infrastructure, because that will help um, drive, it'll help attract investment, and it'll help um, drive the return on, in, on investment. So you'll see a very aggressive um, move to improvement in the family island airports in the in the coming months where you'll actually see uh, shovels in the ground and the yes it's very very bold but we have to i think what we're trying to do is get away from that average where we've been averaging like um, one and a half two percent um, economic growth we got to we have to get into the um three plus you know four percent area over a sustained period we believe that if we have the investment uh, come in, if we are successful in establishing the linkages, and so, for example, um, you know, when, when you have an investment coming into the island, you have employment, yes, but then you also have an impact on the housing market, um, the hospitality market, and that uh, would tend to expand your your GDP. So, a very aggressive pursuit of an, of investment, um, foreign, and efforts to make it easier for Bahamians to, to invest, but also an aggressive, our target is to have three and a half percent of our of our um, GDP invested in, in capital infrastructure. So um, attention to the to the infrastructure that helps to attract it and as well to drive the return. So you are making the point that there are certain um, foundational reforms which have already taken place yeah. and is to germinate in a not too short while, which is going to facilitate this. Program. Right. And including, including, um, you know, we, as, as the governor said, we have to look at ways to, to um, um, get the capital, to mobilize the capital, you know, because the government can't, for example, continue to borrow to, to build the airports. So we, we've been over, again, several administrations developing the whole PPP uh, process. Uh, or the, um, you know, where you have, you know, um, the investment in the infrastructure management agreement put in place so that the government doesn't have to have all that, the, the capital outlay at the very beginning, but it gets the right. advantage of the modern facilities. And so, um, as I said, you will, it, it is our intention that, you know, in very um, short time, you'll begin to see actual shovels in the, in the ground because we have certain areas in this country that are very, very, uh, vibrant, for for example, when we talk about about um, North Eleuthera, Exuma, the Abacos, that um, you know, if you have the investment in the infrastructure, um, the it, the economy will take off. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, to you, uh, Mr. Thompson, I want to come back to a couple of things you said because I think this points uh, or, or becomes a very important um, issue for the way forward. You touch on the energy policy, and you also spoke to the need for reforms around uh, state-owned agencies. If you can just put those two together, the only reason I'm putting those two is because we know as, as we speak, one of the biggest organizations which drives our energy infrastructure is a state-owned agency. Talk to us about where you see us getting with this and how can we uh, get to the place where we finally have a, a viable energy policy, which is responsive to the need for the country going forward beyond 50 years of celebration? So, so let's, I mean, again, huge uh, question, um, but, but let's sort of talk about uh, state-owned enterprises in general, because I think uh, state-owned enterprises in general and, and 
you know, this is something that rating agencies, the, the governor and the central bank um, have all, um, uh, and, and successive administrations have made statements and commitments that uh, we need to reform how we approach these state-owned enterprises because it is, it is you know, in, for, for lack of a better term, sometimes it's like a black hole where you just keep putting money in, money in, money in, and um, uh, there's no uh, political will, I think, to uh, to reform them. And so uh, we have to, and this is one of those, uh, I think, difficult but necessary decisions that uh, we have to systematically look at uh, these state-owned enterprises. Uh, and uh, as I said, we have to either look at privatizing them um, and making them uh, a, a viable private entity, or uh, we have to look at reforming the way that uh, those entities do business so that they can uh, raise revenue to be able to meet their expenses. Um, you know, we have, and again, very, very difficult questions like uh, BPL uh, that has legacy debts that have to be taken care of, but also reforms in terms of uh, how do we take care of the legacy debt, but also look at uh, finding the necessary capital uh, to upgrade the infrastructure uh, uh, to begin to shift towards renewable energy. Uh, I think we have to just start. So for example, we have to look at uh, for microgrids in certain um, uh, family islands. The family islands are actually ideal for a microgrid program. Uh, and I know that um, when uh, I had uh, left the Ministry of Finance, there was a uh, uh, a program that was uh, in place, I believe it is also being continued um, by the present Ministry of Finance, uh, which is looking at different uh, islands to set up microgrids. I know one of the things that we, we had left in place um, would have been putting in place a microgrid in East Grand Bahama, which again is, a, is an avenue to get started. It is not going to obviously solve all of our problems, but it is an avenue uh, to get started and to also look at the other family islands and how can we then put in place microgrids um, in those other family islands as well. We also have to look at the difficult questions of how we deal with Bahamas here. We have to look at the difficult questions of how we deal with the Water and Sewage Corporation. Uh, the government just recently in, in its midterm budget um, is seeking additional uh, to approve additional funding specifically to go towards the uh, water and sewage uh, bills. Um, you know, one of the things that we have not looked at, um, and I know no government wants to do it, is how do we adjust water rates um, in order for the water and sewage company to uh, earn more revenue so that it can eventually become self-sufficient. Um, I believe a study needs to be completed in order to see how that can be done, how that can be adjusted. We go through the necessary consultation processes, uh, but those are difficult decisions that eventually uh, we are going to have to tackle. And obviously nobody wants to see the water rate go up. Nobody wants to see electricity costs go up. Uh, but if we need, if we, if we need to put in place those infrastructure upgrades, we are going to have to, at some point, be able to raise uh, additional uh, capital. And if I could just, just comment on something that um, a senator said um, in reference to the, uh, the economic growth, I think one of the things that we needed to do also uh, is to look at how we digitize that entire process for investors coming in and making it easier for them to apply and getting a response quicker, as well as doing away with the bottlenecks in order to move persons quickly from approval to shovel in the ground. Because I'm sure um, a, the Senator would, would also agree that we may move quicker to approve, but getting people from approval to the shovel in the ground sometimes proves 
difficult when they have to maneuver through the Ministry of Environment and they have to maneuver through the Ministry of Works and so on. So I think we have to look at technology as a solution on how we move persons quickly from getting them approved quickly and then getting them all of the necessary permits quickly so that we can get a shovel in the ground uh, quickly. And I think those are the kinds of things that we need to be able to, to do in order to look at how we increase our economic growth and maintain um, that economic growth. And I think that is important for sustainability. The, the ubiquitousness of energy requires us to have a robust energy plan, uh, robust energy policy, and it requires us to have a serious plan about how we are going to deal with family islands because family islands, I think, represent a significant part of the potential growth. Grand Bahama is always heralded, Abaco is heralded, Eleuthera, but all of these islands need to be taken into consideration. We have to get to the place where we have clear, very, very clear plans so that we can drive investments into these areas based on settled position. I want to go, come to you now, Governor Roll, before we get to our panel of, of uh, media persons who are on and they will be asking some questions. At the Nassau, at the Nassau conference, I think it was last year, late last year, you gave a, a, a very, very insightful speech into some of the policy positions, some of the reforms that you think were necessary. And when you close the speech out, you made a very important, what I consider to be a very important statement, where you said that now that we are rebounding from COVID, the Bahamas is likely to revert to its normal growth potential. And I, I'm singling out that word potential. I want you to speak to us and help us to understand how important it is if we are going to be able to harness the type of a future country that we have been talking about here tonight, how important it is to shift that growth potential, both at the governmental level in terms of the revenue that it takes in and at the macro level as a country, including the citizens and the residents. Now that, it, it, is, it is very important because in that potential is how the government is able to, to reduce the, the debt burden by having a natural growth in its revenue tied to the economy at a sensible rate. And that would mean that there is no increased uh, burden or imposition on the economy or the population uh, to, to get the, the, the debt down to comfortable levels. So from that point of view, um, being able to grow at a faster rate, all else considered, uh, contributes to that. In addition, being able to grow at a faster rate is important if we are going to see the, the rate of job creation uh, pick up. Uh, we, have, we have to appreciate, for example, that if between 2019 and today, the economy is still you know, trying to recover ground, it also means that while additional persons are entering the job market looking for work, most of what we've been seeing since uh, 2001 to present really is just getting uh, people back to work or, or fully employed who were participating in the economy or net uh, pre-COVID. And so again, that speaks to the fact that if, if after we've gotten out of the COVID transition, we settle into what was the historical growth potential, it, it means that we would still have a problem in terms of not sufficiently and satisfactorily getting the people back to work who have been in the queue that's growing since uh, 2020. So getting the growth potential higher even if we're only able to achieve that for a medium term period will help the Bahamas in terms of getting those persons into the, into the job market comfortably who have been on the, on the, on the sidelines since uh, the pandemic started. But I think what we would also recognize is that even as you have the, the challenges around jobs creation that in the industries that are coming on stream with, with, with projects and um, going into operation phase, that some of those challenges also mean that within that 
workforce, uh, employers are going to be looking for people of a certain caliber. Um, and um, you do get, you know, the sense anecdotal, anecdotally that even with the uh, uh, the unemployment challenges, that in many cases, as new investments and businesses come on stream, businesses are still, you know, going to have to make some extra effort to find, you know, a good critical mass of people. So, so that that also is going to become important, I think, in terms of um, tackling the growth potential. And I think it's so important to now, you know, when I, and this is my interpretation, when I read your, your, your speech, and I would entreat anyone who is listening to get a copy of that speech and read through it very, very, very slowly, because it has a, a significant amount of suggestions. Well, it's more than suggestion because it's coming from the governor. That's my word. But it suggests that in order for us to move forward, there's some things that we have to do. I understand that the, 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 the governor will not use a certain words here, but let me put it this way. If the Bahamas does not make the reforms necessary, we are going to get back to the place where we have meandered for the last 15 years or so at about one to a maximum of 2%. And that maximum of 2% is not sufficient to drive the government top line revenue to shift the financial well-being of the government because the government is already operating in my view within a very narrow fiscal space and the onus is there on the government to shift that and the only way that is going to happen is if we have significant reforms if we change the things that we're currently doing if we envision and do some of the things that we have spoke about tonight i believe that we can get there in a more urgent urgent way at this point in time, yeah, well, if I could, could just yeah. add to that. Go ahead, Governor. There is a difference between the government reforming its tax system so that it's more efficiently administered, right. as opposed to reforming the tax system to get more revenue. And yeah, some of the reforms that we've aspired to in many and in recent times have offered me to make the system more efficient. You can do that and stop there, provided in many cases that the economy now um, is more vibrant and then generates for the government the extra returns. And I think that's, I mean, that's the ideal outcome that we would all like to see, which becomes more and more uh, possible or probable if the economy is able to grow uh, faster. Yeah, and so everything hinges on the growth. Now we are going to invite our media practitioners. So we have some persons from the media here with us. So we're going to invite them to put questions to you, the panelists. Uh, over to you, Stefan. Matt? Yeah, I'm going to pitch in for Stefan here. Uh, again, thank you everyone uh, for, for being here. And I wanted to uh, just recognize not only the panelists and our moderator, but the many folks who've, who've, uh, who've, who've monitored in. So we're, we're going to make some uh, make the opportunity for our media uh, representatives to hack some questions directly to the panel and then afterwards we'll be able to facilitate some of those questions that people have been putting in the q a so keep those coming um today we're joined uh from with three three media folks and if i'm missing somebody else that is here please do raise your hand so we can recognize you but we have uh, chester robards from the guardian uh, we have uh, Yuri Kemp from the Tribune, and we have Bethany McDermott from Eyewitness News. So we're going to uh, start with uh, Chester. And Chester, uh, let me unmute you, allow you to talk, and you can go ahead and uh, uh, go ahead and uh, pose your question. Hi, yes. Um, good evening to everyone. I hope you can hear me. Uh, just uh, want to find out. A, 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 I always enjoy the topic of um, uh, of where the country will go um, uh, with regard to what was in the national plan. Um, and there are a lot of things there that deal with the economy. Uh, just really want to find out. Uh, some of the things I think one of the things was expanding the amount of the number of, of local banks and just uh, or behavior owned banks and just how that could be done 
and and really you know how much of an appetite there is for that i i've heard through the grapevine that somebody is thinking of doing one pretty soon i don't know if anyone can speak to that but uh, if maybe you could talk to to that, like how closely can we follow the national development plan when it comes to things like like those things? Well, if I can speak to the the issue of 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 banking, um, the only thing that determines whether uh, a bank would be uh, considered to be added to the space. If it, if it has a viable business plan. And viable business plan for the Bahamas means you can get a, a business operating and you can sustain itself and not lose the funds that depositors have, have, have placed with you. That's often a very difficult thing for people to do in the Bahamas because, I mean, now it's 400,000 persons, but in the past it used to be 300 and something thousand in the population. So this is a very small market. So when we think about aspirations around entering the banking space, I would encourage Bahamians to think bigger than just the Bahamas, because if you're only concentrating on the Bahamas, it's going to be a business model that you're going to struggle uh, to keep up. So if the Bahamas is part of a plan where you're also looking south or in other parts, uh, then I think it's going to... Um, carry more uh, weight. And also when you look at what you might consider to be underserved market or niche, uh, understand that those who are in the business today are in the business to make money. And so ask yourself, why are they not in those markets? And what convinces you that you will make money in those markets? You still have to pay interest on deposits and you have to attract funds at competitive rates. And that is often the challenge that sometimes will, will leave some of the, the business models on, on, on shakier ground. So I would say that the possibilities are there and, 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 and there has to be creativity in terms of what the business models look like. But please also think beyond just a market of an economy of 16 billion GDP and um, think about what you can do beyond the Bahamas. Um, Minister, if, if, or, sorry, Mr. Thompson, you could go first. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Um, I think the, the, the question, the way how I would um, at least give some input on, on that question would be, we have a, uh, I think, a problem that needs to be solved, which is uh, the banks that are already here uh, removing themselves from, you know, the uh, they at least their brick and mortar um, uh, companies. They're they're moving them out of the family islands, which is creating a uh, a very serious problem for uh, for family islands. And I think that is a problem that uh, while we you know can consider as as the um, uh, the governor said uh, those criteria and so on for new banks coming into the into the space we have a problem right now that we need to solve. Um, and, and how do we uh, ensure that we have financial inclusion uh, for uh, those family island uh, persons? And what I would like to see, and again, I, I keep sort of going back to the uh, digitization and the technology, but what I would, what I would like to see, um, and we were pushing for uh, very strongly was the full sort of implementation of the sand dollar, of the digital uh, sand dollar, um, moving into uh, the family island space. Now, obviously that is not going to solve all of the problems immediately, but I believe it uh, could assist. And uh, if we can do more in terms of getting uh, our family islanders educated about the, uh, the sand dollar, if we can get them incentivized to, to begin to use the sand dollar, get those businesses incentivized to use the sand dollar, uh, I believe that that is an avenue um, that uh, can assist with that problem. Um, and uh, I know when I was in, in there, uh, that uh, banks had uh, again determined that they were they were moving out of those uh, family islands. 
um, and uh, that was creating a real, real challenge. I know, for, you know, from personal experience in Andrus, um, you know, the, the challenges in, in Andrus and I'm sure in other of the family islands, you still have that same uh, that same challenge. So I think we have to, um, you know, as a as a as a policy maker or as somebody who um, is in that space, I think we also have to not just look at what uh, some in the private sector want to do, but we also have to direct to ensure that we solve a problem that our uh, uh, people are facing. And and I think that's a, a problem that needs to be solved. And and I think the sand all over the system. Yeah, there, actually, there's, there's no doubt that you know the the answer to the issue of of the underserved, particularly in the in the um, family islands and and you know, particularly the remote family islands, is a digital one. And I think there's there's some um, efforts being made, and hopefully we'll have some some conclusion, um, you know, to to that very very shortly. I think the other problem we have, I think, uh, when we talk about the um, non what they call indigenous banks, is um, a point made by one of uh, a bank I recently spoke to is that when you have your banking sector not um, locally controlled, um, the appetite for risk in terms of local business tends to be less. And so um, I hear the governor's point about, um, you know, being able to have a good business, solid business plan that looks even beyond beyond the shores. And, um, you know, that that is something we, we hope we can see um, come to fruition because some of our, our neighbors in the, in the south have a more expansive locally indigenous owned um, banking system um, that, that, than we have. Um, and so, um, you know, I think that's something we, we, we look forward to, and hopefully more people can step up. And, and, and even that, I would add to that, that I, 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 I think the focus, part of the focus has to be on how you increase ownership, but, but try not to equate that with the, the population of, of institutions growing. So I think, I think the ownership uh, more democratized uh, and more participation from Bahamian and even if you go Caribbean-wise, more Caribbean ownership in the banking sector uh, will be useful. Make sure that we also are shoulder to shoulder with international capital and expertise because that knowledge that comes with it is also very important for the industry. And I, I believe too that insofar as getting into the family islands there are lots of interventions uh, that we have to make around the the digital aspect of it because we have to make the delivery of of, of banking and financial services more efficient if we're going to extend the reach and there, there, there are many elements there which do have public policy uh input because i think that the bahamas of the future is going to have to view data and access to data the way we view other bread basket items uh, that Bahamians consume, because data is really going to determine how, in any legitimate way, Bahamians are able to participate. And we're beginning to see that in terms of how we look at some of the changes that are happening in financial services. That's an important point there, Governor. Um, let's see if we can get our other media representative. We want to get them. Um, out of the way, they have been so gracious to be here. We don't want to miss any, so we can just get the questions in. We're going to have uh, Yuri Kemp uh, from the Tribune uh, go ahead and pose a question. Go ahead, Yuri. Uh, he's muted. Yuri is muted. So in the in the meantime, as we get Yuri sorted out, I think the the responses that we got from the three three uh, members of the panel um, suggests some of the challenges that we are having um, as, as a country. There are huge opportunities we have to confront and tackle with the deficiencies that we have in the family island. We have to get to the place where we talk about uh, financial inclusion. We have to get to the place where we tackle the big issue. Now, I, I, we have heard here this even many, many times that there are some big issues and which government is going to tackle them. Well, I want to propose that the issues that we have today, the administration which, Ms., which Senator Alkitis is a part of, will start to tackle those because 
obviously we don't have any other government and that those type of decisions are going to get the same support which is necessary from the opposition which Mr. Kwesi Thompson represents. And we are going to work as a country as we go into the 50th year and we are going to make great things happen. And then we are going to pull on the intellectual capital that come from places like Governor Roll and the Central Bank. And we are going to make the fundamental shifts that's going to take the Bahamas beyond just possibility to actuality in some of the things that we need to see. Mr. Kemp, are you ready to go? It seems oh. like there, there may be a challenge there. So we're going to go ahead and move to Berthony McDermott uh, yes. from uh, the Eyewitness News. Please ask your question. Go ahead, Berthony. Good afternoon. I'm actually from Our News. But My apologies, I, sir. I actually had three questions that I wanted to ask. The first question was specifically to Minister Halkidis. You mentioned um, in your opening remarks about uh uh, building the future of the economy. So, you know, yesterday or day before, we saw the prime minister deliver the mid-year budget communication. And in that, while we saw revenue was up, expenditure was also up as well as, uh, I think, the deficit and debt as well. So can you explain to us, I guess, how this budget will go towards that in terms of in building the economy, the future of the economy? You're muted. You're muted. Yeah, no, um, just to directly your question about um, the deficit being up, the, the, what the Prime Minister delivered on um, yesterday was a mid-year report, which is a half-time um, snapshot of the performance of the budget of the 2022-2023 budget. And so we are, yes, while the, the revenues are up, the spending are up, we are confident that we will meet the targets that we set in um, when the budget, when the full year budget was presented. And so we expect that, you know, in the second half of the year, um, you know, um, the, the, the cost, the, the, the revenue will continue. We expect it to continue to perform. The second half of the year is normally, is traditionally when the bulk of the revenue is collected. Uh, we had some significant outlays in the first half of the year in terms, in terms of spending. Uh, those will be less in the second half. And so we expect to meet the target of a 4.3% of a um, deficit. And um, that, that's for this current budget year. And going forward to see that reduced um, next year um, to under 1% in the following year, if all goes well to a surplus position. And so it is in keeping, I mean, the we, we anticipate that we are on, we believe that we're on the right track, uh, moving towards, you know, lower deficits, um, lower accumulation, additions to the debt and eventually um, you start to see the debt the debt go down. Um, all of that, of course, is contingent upon um, continued economic growth, no disruptions in the economy like severe recession or, you know, um, even uh, severe hurricane or severe, um, you know, further political disruption in terms of war and conflict. So um, you saw those things um, go up, but um, what I'm saying is we're, that was at the halftime we expect that over the full year, we will we will be on target. Okay. Next question. We we just want to, uh, we kind of press for time a little bit and want to get in some of the other questions. So we're just asking you to keep the questions and the answers as pithy as possible. Go ahead, Mr. McDermott. Um, I'm oh, sorry, I'm trying to be fast. In the central bank governor role, you mentioned in your opening remarks as well about our migration policies in terms of bringing in the, I guess, skills that we need um, to fill certain positions. But I, I mean, anyone can answer, though. What specifically um, adjustments do you, any of you think we should need to make in that regard to, one, bring in the skills that we need, but also ensure that Bahamians aren't overlooked for certain jobs, because that's also been a concern with a number of uh, projects. I remember the point being one of them, to ensure that while we do bring in the skill set that we need, that Bahamians are also giving the opportunities to grow and fulfill some of these um, positions. Okay. You, you want to take that, Governor? I was I was leaving that one for the honorable gentleman. But I think I think just continuing to focus on how you define policies 
to ensure that you're having um, the knowledge transfers uh, that are that that should accompany the skills that are coming in. Um, you also have to recognize, Mr. McDermott, that uh, if I am bringing capital to the Bahamas, I will also expect that I I need to have some amount of management and and and, and skills accompany that capital. So even um, being agile in terms of how um, you you're accommodating investors who are coming in with with, with capital and and some of the the skills that they are bringing with them, and in many cases, it's not that they're going to be bringing skills that may not be in the Bahamas. But there's always going to be some amount of um, you know desire uh, by an investor to bring in some some resources uh, that they're familiar with. But I would say that um, also this becomes important if we're targeting particularly new industries and sectors that we want to, to cultivate. Because in those cases, uh, you might have to be even more liberal at the outset, but you'd better have very defined ways of making certain that Bahamians can train and, 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 and grow into it. And we should not uh, underappreciate what we achieved in financial services. Uh, the amount of education in the area of the law accounting and finance that we still have accumulated in the Bahamas. Um, we didn't start that way, but if we look at what was happening in the Bahamas in the 70s and the 80s and into the 90s, and even the emphasis that the University of the Bahamas and the College of the Bahamas placed in terms of the training, um, you can become an accountant and you can become a lawyer in the Bahamas without having to do any foreign travel studies. And I think in some of the, the fintech and related areas where we have aspirations for growth, uh, we can pair those types of strategies uh, with how we get started if we want to get the infusion of skills and, uh, and capital. Right. And and so the next I... question to Mr. Thompson. Go ahead, Mr. McDermott, for your next question. The last question. Wait, was he about to say something? Or... No, no, go, go ahead. I, I, I'll comment on it um, in, in, within the context of your next question. My next question was specifically to Ms. Minister Alkides again. Um, real fast, in this mid-year budget, we also saw... Okay, a... so if, if you're going back to Minister Alkides, let's get your um, comment very quickly, Mr. Thompson. And then yeah, can... uh, just to add to what, um, what the governor said, I, I think two industries that... Uh, we could look at would be the international arbitration um, and uh, the, the the highly specific, uh, specific technology uh, jobs. Um, so I think those are, are areas that you could look at uh, a having some special uh, immigration policy, but it has to be accompanied by a transfer of knowledge. Um, I don't believe there's any industry that you could open up uh, for uh, additional immigration without having a transfer of knowledge policy. Um, and uh, that those come uh, hand in hand to ensure that if you're going to let uh, persons, highly skilled persons come in, that there is a mechanism that those highly skilled persons will train sufficient Bahamians to be able to take on uh, those new industries. And I agree with, with Governor, it should be in those new industries that that uh, policymakers determine this is an industry that we want to build. This is a new industry that we want to bring in uh, to, the, to the country. And so to build that industry, uh, that you may shift the immigration policy. Thank you. So your final question, ask the minister, the minister a yes or no question for me, please. Okay. It ain't a yes, but it'll be dead fast. Minister, I just also kind of wanted to get if you could give us um, an expert, a reasoning for, or maybe defend against the recent um, increase to the travel budget that was also mentioned in the mid year mm. budget. Um, just right quickly, I, I would like to say that um, I think we need to recognize uh, some people equate the travel budget to um, ministers traveling or politicians traveling. That's the entire travel budget for the government. So um, at some point, we'll give a breakdown as, you know, that's that's people going on training courses, um, police traveling, for example, to go and train defense force traveling. 
um, people from, you know, the Department of Health. That's the entire. So we shouldn't equate that with ministers traveling or, you know, politicians traveling. And um, and I think the second point is we're we're making comparisons as well to a point where where the um, two points, and I'll be quick, we're making comparisons to a point where not much was happening, so we're coming from a low base. And um, I think, you know, the travel can be, um, when we talk about the politicians' travel, I think, you know, it can be justified because you're talking about attending conferences and investment promotion and that sort of thing. You know, travel is always going to be one of those things that persons jump on. Uh, my personal view is if the country was to get the travel budget wrong, um, I'm not trying to belittle the point in any way, but if you were to get the travel budget wrong and everything else right, I would be good because at the end of the day, never ever pass a few um, millions. But, so we, but we need to ensure that the level of accountability and transparency is brought to bear. And so we are happy to hear, uh, Minister, that you're going to provide a breakdown going forward. I think we have a question from JCN. Do we have JCN here before we get into our Q&A? We have to move very quickly because we are also on radio and we have a cutoff point. So we want to make sure that we do not cheat our radio listeners. Do we have JCN? It, it doesn't seem like we have a question at this stage. Uh, so we can okay. move into uh, we can move into the, the Q&As. All right, let's get into them. So we have a number of questions here. Um, Pam Burnside asks, how can we attain anything in the country without a nonpartisan national plan? Why was the national plan canceled and put on the shelf? And for this round, we are going to go very quickly. So you have to keep your answers very short. So why did we why did we cancel the plan, Minister Alpetis, uh, Honorable Quasi Thompson? Why did we not have uh, a, a, a well put together plan and we have gone over about three administrations and we are still not applying it. You're muted. I think, we had a, I think we had a well put together plan and um, you know um, the the uh, Prime Minister Christie invested a lot of capital in it and um, and um, to the point even where I made the decision to put it in the University of the Bahamas to sort of remove any any political um, stain so to so to speak mm -hmm. and um you know there was wide um consultation uh, we've made a, a commitment to um implement it and i think that's something we can do in conjunction you know with all of the stakeholders so um you know we're, we're looking to to be able to revive that because a lot of work went into it and i think it was at a, a good roadmap okay mr thompson your input on that no because i, I we're going to need you both to work together to get this going yeah, I, I mean, personally, I'm one, one of those who uh, believes that th there should be a shared vision uh, for a shared national vision uh, for uh, for the country. And our political debate really should be in how we achieve that national shared vision. Um, and so I think, you know, the the uh, I believe that uh, we should achieve that shared uh, vision that everyone can uh, agree to those big concepts and that our political uh, debate and political differences would then be how we achieve those those uh, those goals. I think that is well put. Uh, I believe before we get back to the National Development Plan, the first thing that all active political parties must do is to sign a very much binding agreement which says we are going to abide by this plan going forward. I think it's very, very important that we get that level of consensus, that we have that level of commitment in order to move forward. This one is for you, Governor. Question for the Governor. In terms of exchange control, is there any consideration for reducing the 1.0125 interest rate used in wire transfer transaction to the cash rate of 1.00? Um, I, I, I'm not sure I understand the question uh, fully, the, the, but, but there is there is there is commission on foreign exchange transaction, and I think we should appreciate that it isn't something that is local to the Bahamas. That is a part of the cost of of doing uh, international payments and transfers. 
And in the case of the electronic transfers, uh, the, the, um, the rate in this case is, is slightly higher. Um, we don't always notice it in the Bahamas, or we assume that often in, in foreign exchange transactions with local credit cards and the like, that somehow it's, it's specific to the Bahamas because we see that the dollar is being tied to the U.S. But you will see it uh, just as plainly if you move outside of the U.S. dollar space and you're using a U.S. dollar card in, to pay for goods and services in Europe or uh, Asia. So I think we need to appreciate that that is really a part of the, the structure for on the line cost international payments. But there is a, a global focus on how we can make uh, payments across border uh, cheaper. And, and the targets that are being focused on and defined really reduce down to the level of what it's costing people to send a couple of hundred dollars. And how long does it take uh, to get from point A to point B? So there, there is a, a global focus on how you can make the cost of sending money uh, less expensive for the, for the small man. Okay, thank you so much. Um, this one is more of a comment than a question. Independence means not having to rely on, each, on others. Um, not quite. I think there is a level of interdependence, especially at the at the national level, sovereign, sovereign to sovereign, country to country. There always have to be some level of interdependence. But we have to get to the place, um, to the essence of your point. We have to get to the place where we start to do more for ourselves. How can how can an agreed national development plan ensure? and improve delivery and performance of our national socioeconomic experience to the road beyond 50. How can a plan help us to deliver more on a national socioeconomic experience? And I guess this would be a more positive national socioeconomic experience. I think I think because you, you would have a consensus on firstly what your objectives are, what what the outcomes would be, and then coming out of that would be an agreement as to you know challenge ch channeling your resources um, to to achieve um, those ends. So if for example we take the governor's point made earlier that okay we want to invest more in in um, postgraduate um, edu education then you know that that be that becomes the aim and then you're able to to um challenge resources and and get consensus that you know this is an outcome um, that we want to have if you're talking about things like not you know universal health insurance then you 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 agree that this is an outcome and then so uh, coming out of that is agreement that okay this is how we get the resources and we need to challenge the resources in in those ways okay Given Mr. Thompson's communication on blue-orange economic growth, what is the position of the government, central bank, on easing controls to allow creators to benefit from content creation compensation on social media platforms? So I think uh, one of the first things that we need to ensure is that we have a, a, a better intellectual property uh, legislative regime. Um, I think that is one of the most important things that we need to do in terms of protecting uh, persons with the uh, artisans and so on with the orange economy. The second thing I think we need to do is to uh, provide some more support for them. Um, we need to provide the mechanism upon which they can reach the world. Uh, so uh, a national uh, digital uh, marketplace uh, uh, should be constructed uh, uh, simply for them. Um, and then I think we just need support for in terms of funding. Um, we have to make sure that they have what they need, that they have the resources that they need to uh, to, to sort of fulfill their their greatest um, potential. I think there's so much potential in in uh, Junkanoo and in uh, uh, those uh, persons who are painters and musicians. I mean, there is so much potential for them to reach the world, um, and and I believe the world wants to hear from them and wants to. Uh, experience them. Yeah. So it's 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 up to us um, in terms of policymakers to be able to make that uh, mechanism easier for them. But I think one of the, the, the biggest things that we uh, need to do is to make sure that the intellectual property laws are put in place 
are now updated uh, to be able to protect them. Perfect. Governor, um, so, quickly. Um, there are two, there are two, two, points, two points that I would make, Hubert. Um, and one of them is exchange control, and the other is sand dollar. Why do I say exchange control? Because uh, between 2017 and 2019, uh, there were some changes in terms of exchange controls to give Bahamians more direct access to raising capital if they need to in US dollars to fund investments in parts of the economy, blue, orange, or related nature, but that are tied into tourism. And, and the point there is that uh, we want to give um, entrepreneurs access to resources where necessary to invest, to tap into those sectors. What is very critical along with that, though, is that um, I think we have to equip um, more of the entrepreneurs and the aspiring entrepreneurs to, to be able to attract capital on the basis of the, the quality of the projects and proposals they put together. But certainly, from the point of view of providing that access, uh, we are fully on board with Central Bank and we're open to being progressive and developing recommendations so that the government can also uh, endorse the movement. Now, to mention for the sand dollars, just this. If you're talking about the orange economy and tying in the small man to the tourist who's traveling and is only spending using a card or some other digital means, then we have to empower all of the micro and small businesses to be able to accept digital payments. And I see some of that in terms of the product development that are already happening, but I also see it, and I think it needs to be pushed more in terms of someone being able to go into the straw market or to buy products of citrus from any bohemian who's selling their wares. Uh, to okay. a local international. So tying them in through the digital channels becomes very important. And, and I, I, I think uh, the maturity that we will get from something such as the sand dollar will put that possibility more within the reach of more Bahamians. Good. I, I have a quick follow-up question for you, Governor. Do we need um, indigenous banking to make sand dollar work? No, but I, I, I think what we will see just so that people appreciate um, this is a this is a a, pro, a process and and it 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 is going to take um, more time and perhaps in some cases more time than than I imagine. But what we're seeing now is we are having you know very fruitful conversations with the commercial banks. There is at least one bank that has been doing lots of work in terms of getting their staff acclimatized to to the sand dollar. So. Uh, we're going to be working with them soon in terms of how they extend that to the population. That's um, Bank of the Bahamas. Um, we're also looking at uh, some of the other banks in terms of getting them, you know, to to think about use cases, particularly where you're reducing your physical uh, footprint and how you can provide all of your customers with more access to the digital channels, and and so. We anticipate that that uh, transition and momentum is going to uh, increase and grow, grow over time. So, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm positive that I'm confident that the banks are going to be there. Um, and and okay. some of it literally uh, is a... us being equipped to, to sit with them from a resourcing point of view. Right. So let's get through some of these as quickly as possible. We have a couple of more minutes to go before we have to call the squits. Bahamian also need to be empowered if pillars of our economy will continue to reside in tourism and banking, which are dominated. Just lost the question. Okay, um, let's take another one. When will government change their focus from mainstream tourism, especially since the pros from the foreign direct investment present greater negative externalities than positive? Uh, Senator... Alkitis, do you want to take that quickly? Yeah, I think, um, I don't think we change our focus completely, but I think, uh, as I said earlier, that um, the preferences and the, and the appetites have changed in the aftermath of a COVID that really gives opportunities uh, for Bahamians uh, to, to, to become involved in the industry. People wanting to stay in smaller 
properties, um, people wanting a, a more um, island experience, a beach experience, you know, that screams opportunity for particularly our, our family islands and individuals even in New Providence who want to offer a more local experience. So I think, you know, just as as, as COVID, you know, was a, was a boon for delivery service and, and remote uh, service delivery, I think um, it, it provides an opportunity because of the change in appetite for more Bahamians to come to become involved. Yeah, definitely. Digitization with infrastructure upgrade is a no-go. Family islands have electrical costs con cuts continuously. They don't have banks. They don't have reliable internet. You need to be willing to invest in the necessary infrastructure that must be reliable and efficient. One can't work without the other. Governments, unfortunately, have tunnel vision and cannot see the whole picture, so it is fragmented and will not work. Education is also key, not only at UB level, but from primary school. It all starts there. Is investment in education being looked at in this way? Minister Thompson, uh, if you want to take that, even though... Yeah, the no, I, I, yeah absolutely. I mean, I, I think the, the, the question is, is spot on. Um, you know, you, you can't have the, the digitization without having the the necessary infrastructure. You have to have the connectivity. Um, you also have to have the education uh, for persons and the appetite for persons to be able to, to use it. But that does not mean you do not start. Um, it, it, it does mean that you are still put in place the infrastructure so that people in the family islands can have access to it. So, for example... The the, uh, the the passport office is a prime example of, of re when, when it comes to renewing passports. We, we had completed that uh, renewal of passports where you were able to renew it within six days, uh, 14 days, and any, any person anywhere along in the Bahamas would have been able to uh, apply to renew their passport. So you, you cannot just stop and wait for you to put the infrastructure in, but you must go ahead and, and, and have them on a dual track where you must put the infrastructure in, but you must also go ahead and put all of the digitization uh, processes in at the same time. Education is key. Thank you. You have to start from primary school as well. Sorry. <laughs> Let me just, just uh, 30 seconds to say that in terms of the infrastructure and the data and the Wi-Fi and the tech, um, technological infrastructure, in the last budget, we put in concessions for companies who want to put in things like fiber and so you can have better data. And um, the the um, family island um, going forward, 25%, and I think it goes up to 27% of, of funds that collect, are collected in real property tax and road taxes will be put in a family island infrastructure fund to help develop those uh, family islands. So um, the, co the commenter made some very good points, and those are some steps already being taken to, to have the investment in the technology and the infrastructure. There is just one point um, on this um, that I'd want also for Minister Halkidis to look at as well is in this recent budget, the 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 the, the government had actually cut uh, the family island infrastructure that was in the Ministry of Finance. Um, so I think we need to look at that as well uh, because again, okay. as the as the the, the question is the person who asked the question said, we need to to continue to build that family island infrastructure. Definitely. Vision for a better Bahamas have been shared over the last 50 years. The challenges come in converting these visions into effective programs to bring about the desired change. What steps must be taken to realize these visions for the Bahamas? I think we touched on that a little bit, but I will hand that back over to you, Minister Alkitas. Consultation, a, a process by which the public can become involved and believe that their voices are heard and um, take, taken into account. That, that is the only way we have to have consensus because all of the things we, we, we've spoken about, reforming the way we do things, um, privatization, adjustments in fees, et cetera, um, if, we, if we agree that we need to get to, to a certain point, and this is the vision, it begins with that broad consultation at every level. Okay. To you, Governor, do you foresee the government making it easier for Bahamians to invest in world markets? For example, having a threshold of under 100K where you can invest in US and European securities without approval and just a notification to the central bank. Do you see that happening anytime soon, quickly? I, I, I think over time we, we're gonna progress and have um, more less restrictions on how, how those types of transactions occur. 
Uh, the the only, I think, area that we, we would be cautious in the, I think, the near to medium term would be any thoughts about completely getting rid of the 5% premium which presently exists for investment mm -hmm. currency. But I, I, I think there is scope for uh, Bahamians to, you know, to come forward and, and, and try to make more investment, particularly at the retail level, internationally. Yeah. Especially since um, they have been admonished to save more, then we need to have more avenues for the investment. Can the country move forward without Freedom of Information Act enacted and active? Can we move forward without proper whistleblower legislation that protects and reward persons who step forward to expose corruption? Minister? Um, freedom of Information is in, in the stage of implementation. Um, you would have heard the, I think the um, information commissioner was in the press recently speaking about the fact that he's training, I think, 10 departments. It's a process. Um, they established it, well, you had the legislation, the employment of the um, commissioner and his and his support staff and the training and putting in place the bureaucracy that will support it. So it's an ongoing process. I think it's safe to say um, both um, administrations, all, all recent administrations uh, support it. And, um, you know, the, the question is, should see you know, to, you know, more rollout as time goes on. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I think also um, agreed. Uh, I think both both administrations had agreed to it. Um, I know the the uh, uh, FNM, I believe, had put in the, had actually implemented the whistleblowing portion of the, um, uh, of the Freedom of Information. Uh, we would like to see uh, a specific timeline um, uh, for the implementation of it. I know that the question was asked in Parliament the other day, and uh, the government wasn't able to give a timeline, but I think we would like to see uh, a timeline um, uh, in terms of moving forward. But yes, we both agree uh, that uh, we must put that um, our Freedom of Information Act. It is essential uh, to be able to, uh, to look at it. Uh, it's an important issue in terms of governance. It's an important issue in terms of us moving forward. Um, from and, Mr. Hubert, can I actually Williams, just plug in very, you, very quickly uh, here on this? So how, I'm sorry. Yes, just just a, a quick a quick uh, plug on this. Uh, corruption being one thing that I think everybody across the board is agreeing is a critical issue has to be addressed. There's opportunities that we gain from it both locally and and by and in, and externally in all of this economic uh, strategy. Um, we are actually hosting an uh, anti-corruption symposium next Friday on March 3rd. Org and partnering with government, and the Ministry of Finance, uh, with with uh, the University of Bahamas, uh, with a lot of different groups to really post and talk about not just how bad it is, but more importantly, what we've done already and how we leverage those collective efforts. So please uh, keep focused on that. And and uh, uh, our three panelists, we'd love you all to be a part of that as well. So we'll keep you posted. Uh, I okay, so let's get back to on, on the questions. We have a question here from Mr. Ian Williams. What new adjustments are being tailored towards the regressive tax regime present in the Bahamas given the fact that citizens are further being constrained given the nominal wages earned. Minister, Mr. Thompson, what has been done to address the regressive tax regime? I'll leave that to Minister. <laughs> <laughs> We're studying it. We did, like I said in, in my, in my in the earlier comment, um, in the aftermath of the uh, Global Minimum Tax Initiative, um, a study was commissioned. Um, it's it spanned um, um, uh, I think three administrations now we're in receipt of the of the report they have made certain suggestions um, a consultation paper is being finalized that will come out to the public for consultation on on the way forward and and uh, what we do in terms of okay. taxation we look forward very to shortly that. yeah mm -hmm. since not all Bahamian state-owned entities have been a failure like BTC before its sale is it not a misrepresentation to say there is no political will to reform state-owned enterprises, given that the mismanagement of revenue and other structural gaps maintained through ample institution practices are far more prevalent and the reason for SOE's failure? Um, Mr. Thompson, is that something you want to take? Uh, the person is asking, the person is basically saying, you know, not all SOEs are bad. And the reason that SOEs are, are bad when they are bad is because of ample institutional practice. 
how do we deal with that issue? No, I, I think I think it's right. I mean, um, there, there are cases where uh, the state-owned enterprises make money. There, there are cases where the, the state-owned enterprises, the, the the difficulty is the, the sort of the central central government that is interfering in uh, in their uh, you know in their business. So there are cases, yes, that, that that happens. But where we have a challenge is in those ones where the government has to continue to subsidize them. And those are the ones that we are speaking of that need the reform. Uh, and it's it's reform inside of those institutions, but it's also reform outside in terms of how the central government deals with them. Um, it, it We cannot continue doing the same thing. We cannot continue using uh, the, the state-owned enterprises as our, you know, political uh, playgrounds. But we have to make sure that they are independent, they are separate, they are vibrant, they are able to uh, collect their revenue, um, they are able to to be managed like a business. And if we cannot do that, then we ought to give them to someone who can. Um, and so those are the, 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 the kind of avenues that I was talking about, those areas where it is a it is a drag on the public purse, and that's mm-hmm. where we need the reform. Okay, and we can get to that. Uh, Governor, I'm not sure whether you can take this one, but I think between you and Senator Hal Peters, we should be able to get an answer. Uh, where where do we stand now on the future of crypto and blockchain? It seems the momentum has been lost on the hub idea, but other countries continue to ready their economies for crypto. Where are we going now? The, I don't think the idea has been abandoned. Um, you know, we'll, you'll see some more communication from, from us um, in terms of continuing to promote the, the jurisdiction. We had, of course, the unfortunate um, circumstances surrounding um, FTX. Um, the, um, I think um, as more information has come to light, we've seen that our regulators have acted uh, swiftly and, and appropriately. So we think it's still a, a space to, um, you know, whereby we can become a hub. Um, it is by its nature an industry that's very volatile. And, um, you know, I think investors uh, should would be wise to treat it as such when it comes to their asset allocation. But I don't think we throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think it's, it's still a viable niche. If, okay. if I can also, um, also, Mr. Edwards, what I think needs to happen now is we have to examine the the entire circumstance because I think we have to examine uh, the Dare Act um, again. It was something that that uh, you know we on this side had uh, had passed. We were completely uh, uh, in into pushing the Bahamas as a hub. We also still continue to agree that the Bahamas should still be pushed as a hub. But I think we have to, given what has taken place, uh, we have to examine it. And we have to examine whether uh, we have all of the necessary tools uh, to move forward. We have to examine whether the Securities Commission has all of the necessary tools to move forward. Uh, uh, Does the DARE Act need to be adjusted? Um, So I think we have to look at the, just take take a look at it. And see what uh, the way how we can uh, improve and how we can learn from uh, what has taken place. Uh, but I agree, uh, we should continue and push uh, uh, this industry 100. percent Thank you so much. There's another question from Atario uh, Atira and health is well. What is the plan for strengthening the healthcare sector to plug the expansive non-paying categories of public health system? In the public health system, retain Bahamian talent to not just TNs, and uh, I'm not sure what that is, and doctors, uh, support clinical educational advancement, specialty, create organizational charts that promote employee growth and progression, and to consider PPP with staff. Uh, how are we? What are some of the things that we're looking at um, for the future Bahamas, Minister? Alkitas, I think it's it's um the the main I think one of the main points coming out of the question was how do we um and it's 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 it's, it's this difficulty with a state-owned enterprise when you have for example a public hospitals authority or Ministry of Health that you know gets three hundred plus million dollars allocated in the budget and in terms of revenue it's under ten um what how do you strike that balance between your revenue collection and making health um, available. 
and um, you know, so um, that is that is something that's a that's a, you know requires a, a lot of work. It's an ongoing process, um, but it's similar to when we talk about water as a state-owned enterprise. You know, how do you tackle that that issue? But um, there is some significant investment ongoing in terms of rehabilitation of the of the health infrastructure. And um, I mean, just uh, just because we're pressed for time, some very good points in terms of of of, of retaining the training. Um, not a not a health expert, but you know um, we're graduating a lot of doctors. We'd love to retain to retain them all, um, you know, and and we just have to expand our facilities to be able to do that. Okay, thank you so much. Um, this one is definitely for you, Governor Roll, because it has some interesting words in there that I don't even know. Um, Governor Roll discusses the vast amount of wealth within the country. However, what is often neglected is the health disparity in two thousand. And 12, the Bahamas Gini coefficient index was 57. The assertions made in this roundtable seem to exclude the current state of wealth disparity and other factors like race, class, and gender, which are fundamental to having a holistic understanding of where the country currently is and its potential future. Why have the panelists included these critical areas from their economic assessment? Governor Rubin. Well, they were not excluded. Uh, that is why I think uh, when we look at uh, the distribution and how the government resources itself, it does come back to whether you're, you're raising uh, revenue by a, applying um, your collection policies evenly across the population. And when we start to talk about income taxes, I think we, we do begin to tackle the issue of how we redistribute the burden of how the government finances itself. And I think it does get into uh, a lot of the issues that the individual is is um, pointing at. And I sincerely hope that when the government puts out its consultation paper, uh, that the public will uh, have a lively discussion that draws in those various issues and hopefully also appreciate the tensions that are involved with, with coming to, to, to con consensus. And definitely, because that's one of the most important issue, um, writer of the question. You know, we have to look out for the vulnerable grouping in this country. And as we grow and develop, as the Prime Minister said in his, in his lecture at UB, while the country has grown significantly over a number of years, we have not found a way to significantly and in a sustainable way affect many of those who are operating at the margin. We have had here, I think, a very broad-based discussion. We are kind of clean out of time, and so we are going to bring this roundtable to an end. I think it was a very useful conversation. I think we had panelists who were very open and transparent, and they gave us as much as they could. We understand that sometimes when you sit in the seat of power, you can't say all of the things, but I think they came as close as possible as is allowable. So we're going to start to wrap this up. And so we'll start with you, Governor, if you could give us your final words, and then we'll go to uh, uh, Minister Thompson. And finally, we will leave the man who is sitting in the seat at the moment to give us the wrap. Uh, thank you, Hubert. I think, um, as was hinted upon in the, the comments, um, using the National Development Plan as an example, uh, the Bahamas has extensively explored you know, what uh, it can or, or, or could do you know, to, to improve uh, the economy and, and, and social and other circumstances. And I think it does come down now to having the very uh, important discussions and embracing uh, the trade-offs and reforms that, that are involved in that process. Uh, we have a bounty of ideas. Um, now the opportunity is to select from those ideas and, and to execute. Thank you so much, Governor Roll, for your participation. Mr. Thompson? Um, thank you very much again. It, it, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, it was uh, really a privilege to share um, with uh, uh, Minister Halkidis, as well as with uh, Governor Roll, um, uh, in a in a non-political um, uh, discussion, 
um, and uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not actually normal. possible. As as well as it's not it's not normal, um, but I think it, it may have been the inclusion of Governor Roll that has uh, had a sort of, sort of tempered the uh, the the political uh, back and forward. Uh, but I believe that's just for tonight. I'm sure that um, the the time will come when when we will uh, have a more robust political discussion. But uh, but in just in conclusion, the it has been a very good discussion, and and if I was to leave. Uh, just one thing to emphasize, it would be on the digital transformation, that that really is key for us to move forward uh, to a future uh, economy that is going to be successful. And uh, I would want, I would uh, definitely push uh, the government to uh, take that digitization uh, from where we left it, uh, move it on to a, a completely uh, higher level, uh, and then whoever uh, is able to then uh, just take it uh, beyond, uh, because that is one of the key to our success. It is one of the key factors uh, to moving our economy forward, to the ease of doing business, uh, to the to the better service for uh, for our people. Um, it is it is one of those things that uh, can touch us on every avenue. It can touch us in education. It can touch us in our economy and business. Banking, it touches us uh, all over and uh, to be able to bring satisfactory service for the people. And that's one of the factors that we have to always bear in mind when it comes to government and, and moving our policies forward. How is it impacting people? And is, is, is it improving the lives of people? And definitely, if we focus on digital transformation, it will improve the lives of people. So thank you again for the opportunity. It's certainly a pleasure having you here. Thank you for being here. Minister Halkitis? Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Edwards, for, and the ORG uh, for uh, this invitation. It's been a pleasure. Um, thank you, and it's been a pleasure speaking with Minister Thompson as well as, as Governor Roll. Um, as we look at, um, you know, we've had, or we will soon be celebrating 50 years of political independence. I believe the next 50 years will be um, the time for uh, deeper uh, social development and as well economic empowerment. Uh, we must promote a, um, an environment of, of stability and promote equality so that as we move forward, and uh, when we talk about economic growth, we're talking about balanced growth and shared prosperity. So thank you very much once again and good evening to all. And thank you so much for being here, Senator. Uh, we So we've heard about the many options that we have so we need to dust these off and we need to make wise choices. We have to move to a state where we have a marshal in digital transformation to move us into the next 50. And of course, as we grow and develop, there must be stability, there must be equity, there must be a shared prosperity. And I think that is a great place to end this evening. One of the things which this evening has demonstrated is that we have the ability and the capacity to sit and have discussions which are useful, narrative, which are productive, and which are geared towards finding solutions. We have to do more of that. Because at the end of the day, if we are going to gain more than we would have gained in the last 50 years, it's going to require the intellectual capital of all air in the Bahamas. So we are very, very delightful, delighted, sorry, to have been able to bring this to you on behalf of all of the persons at ORG, Matt, Stefan, Candy, Tate, and the entire uh, team and the board there. We were certainly delighted to be able to bring this to you. We want to also give our shout out and thank you to the team over at Guardian Radio who has supported us and give us a little bit of overtime. For the persons who have asked questions and didn't hear them, we are going to take them and figure out a way of how we can get some responses and get those back to you. At the end of the day, this is the thing I want to leave us with. If we are in the business of managing this experiment called democracy, we have to realize that at times we are going to disagree. But at the end of the day, it must be that we disagree in such a way that we find what is best in the best interest of country, in the best interest of people. And so we want to thank every single one for listening. And we want all of us to go away with the attitude that the next 50 year is going to be different. And the reason it's going to be different is because we are going to keep having the conversations and keep doing the things which are necessary to make that different. We always end our program on radio by saying, 
Do not allow your greatness become a victim of your unwillingness to change. For all of the reforms that is necessary, Minister Alkitas, Mr. Thompson, and Governor Rule, we must make those changes in order to unearth our greatness. And so all that is left to said is, walk good, one love, Ubuntu, and good night. This has been a special episode of The Essentials with Hubert Edwards. Tonight, Hubert hosted the Organization for Responsible Governance's Economic Roundtable with the theme, The Road Beyond 50, a discussion on the vision for the next 50 years of development of the Bahamian economy. Panelists were Minister of Economic Affairs, Senator the Honorable Michael Halkidis, Member of Parliament and Shadow Minister of Finance, Kwesi Thompson, and Governor of the Central Bank, John Roll. So